All right, hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here at Smirking Interviews, back to talk more Doom Patrol. We're on season one, episode three. It's called Puppet Patrol. So, full spoilers, we haven't seen this episode. Again, another really, really awesome episode. A little bit of a step back, but it starts strong, really strong, or ends strong, I should say. Becomes very much like a preacher episode, if you ask me. The, the way that the fight scene at the end plays out, very preacher esque. Um, but we just start off with like little, just tiny details, like the fact that the the sign that she's uh, covering uh, with her own signs, Jane's putting up uh, missing signs for the chief. Um, but over that, underneath those, uh, there's a poster for a hamster or a gerbil that answers to the name of Annabel Lecter. <laughs> Please tell me we're going to meet this this animal. Also, on the posters that she's putting up. The word lost is written just like the the way that the show lost is written like in promo pictures or like on the DVDs in fact I mean I should go grab it real quick just to show you guys what I'm talking about but it's written in the same style so I don't know if that's kind of a, a nod to somebody on the show liking lost but uh, during this whole thing though she's listening to some loud music and she doesn't realize that practically the whole town it seems is following her uh, they're not happy <laughs> so after the events of the first two episodes even though they came back uh, from the vortex that is the, the donkey's trans-dimensional butthole or mouth or whatever <laughs> they're not happy they want her out of there um, which leads to a pretty funny moment when she staples the thing to the guy's head uh, that was pretty good um, when Victor is uh checking out the video he's got he has those memories of the uh, night of the accident thought that that was really cool that he's going back in and studying it now you'd think that this is something he would have noticed right away but i mean i felt like the explosion uh that blew the whole place up was like he threw that stuff across the room but the explosion happened from another side of the room and I guess that's probably why all of a sudden Mr. Nobody's name came up in the thing. Um, but they do look like separate events. Like he smashed something, but I don't think that stuff blew up. That was, it also reminded me very much like how Barry Allen got his powers, except there was no lightning. Um, <laughs> in the chief's office, he's got uh, some interesting drawers full of glass eyes and lots of candy. Uh, that's all really weird. Uh, a hoarder and diabetic. Uh, Clara Steele information is also found here, and we get a picture of the donkey. Uh, also, Larry wakes up in the rafters. And we get a lot of... This is kind of Larry's uh, episode, thrown in with, like, uh, more about Jane as well. And, you know, the Larry story from 1961 is... It's fine. I... I I like seeing some of the details in here. The rest of it I don't really care about. The whole, like, him being uh, afraid to come out in 1961 uh, while his friend was more than willing to, you know, like, oh, I'm leaving the army, I'm sick and tired of pussyfooting around, and that's great. You know, great, good for that character. But, I mean, 1961 coming out after, you know, that, that would have been nearly an impossible feat to pull off and be accepted. So I don't, you know, people need to come out on their own time. Larry's problem was that he went and uh, did what a lot of guys did, which was try to be a straight man uh, instead of living their truth. And, you know, ended up being with, you know, kind of <sighs> having relationships with somebody that they don't really, you know, they care for, but they don't love. And that's kind of like unfair to that person as well as the situation that they're in, right? It's a, it's a hard decision. It's a tough decision that they shouldn't have to. They should have been able to come out and say, I'm gay. Okay? I'm saying that. But it's also just as bad to lead somebody, let somebody live a lie like that for your sake of a lie. You know, that poor, whether it's a woman or a man that does this, 
I find it pretty distasteful to pretty much waste somebody's life. All the years that you can't get back living a fake relationship with somebody. And while you may have kids and that's great, you know, it's 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 a tough time. It's a tough thing. And I, I have the benefit of, you know, I, I don't have those problems. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm making light of them or that uh, I don't understand. But it's just, that's just how I see it. You know, like there's, if, if you're gay, be gay. If you're not, you know, if you if you get if you nah, I'm not digging. I'm gonna dig myself a hole here. <laughs> I just it, I'm just seeing it from different sides is all. Uh, we find out about the Brotherhood of Evil. Um, Silas uh, cuts Victor off from the Star Labs corporate credit card and jets, so it's time to take the bus literally. Um, this was kind of a funny scene showing the, the road trip situation, how they don't get along. Um, Larry's hitchhiker acting out, breaking the car down. Um, we get a bunch of nice, quiet character moments here. Uh, mostly people kind of butting heads with Cyborg, him kind of calling them out, you know, especially him and Rita. Um, I thought it was kind of funny that we in this show we mix a lot of old technology with new technology. Um, we get the he's making a phone call from a payphone, which there in I haven't seen a real payphone in a while. Now maybe they're in big cities, but I was thinking if the hotel has like a modern like camera to watch people. First off, it's watching people on the phone. But they have a payphone, and they have like an updated surveillance camera. It just seems weird. I li but I do also like that mix of it, like the Coke machine that they see. It's like an old Coke machine. Um, well, we also find out because Rita takes a really long time in the bathroom uh, that one of Jane's personalities is named Flit, and Flit's a teleporter, and Flit immediately transports everybody to Paraguay. Well, Robot Man and uh, Larry. Now, why didn't it take Rita and um, and Cyborg? I think probably because they weren't there. Like, right there. Um, but I, I do like that each power is something unique. We're, we're, we're fleshing this out. We're not just seeing a couple uh, here, which I was what I was worried about initially. We also find out that this place is called Fooktopia. <laughs> Fooktopia, just another way for somebody to say fuck on the show, which is fine. Um, and we find out that the operation that this guy's got going is still running. That down here in Fooktopia, you can still pay to have uh, this doctor uh, and his people do stuff to you to give yourself powers. Now you'd think that that would be something that the Justice League would take care of. You know? Um, people popping up with powers out of nowhere. You know, you'd think that somebody like Batman or, you know, like from the Watchtower or however far along the Justice League is in this world, um, that this would be something they would have squashed a long time ago. But for story's sake, fine, you know. Do you always have to find the like the, the dark corners of the world where people aren't looking? But it seems to be, I mean, at least with this guy, he, you know, it's still a known entity. Um, they get, okay, so then we, when they get to uh, this place, we get this whole really cool puppet exposition dump, which is very, very funny. Uh, it's very well done. You get to know that the reason everything, like, w the reason Morden's the way he is is because... Uh, the chief came in and kind of stopped it inadvertently. He shot the prof this Nazi bastard, and then, in a in a way, I guess it stopped the machine from finishing. And that's why Mister Nobody is what he is, and probably why he's got an axe to grind with the old chief. So I and again, it's a nice, interesting way of giving us exposition instead of just having characters stand there and going blah, 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 back and forth for like five minutes. They found another original way to do it. Um, we also find out that that, that, uh, that chamber has other dimensional power, power properties. 
that gives you stuff like from all over the place. So the the possibilities for this chamber would have been endless. I mean, maybe there are well, there are more chambers in here as we find out. Um, when Jane offers her blood uh, as payment over all the credit cards that don't work. I was like, that's not a good idea. And I also really like the small detail that if you weren't paying attention was that these Swiss Miss motherfuckers uh, all seem to be connected by the by one mind. Like when one thing is happening to someone, it pay, can pay attention to what's happening to another one in a different room, in a different area, very much like a hive mind. And it also kind of deals like, that's an interesting metaphor with the puppets and the pulling the strings and the control from somewhere else, you know. Very, very cool, because it's like foreshadowing, that you don't even really know that it's foreshadowing. I, I, I dig that so much. Um, we also find out that Larry, when he came out of the crash, when he was in the hospital, he was giving off so much radiation that he killed basically the entire hospital. <laughs> so they had to put him in a fucking like locked up anti-radiation chamber. Um, Silas Stone, Victor's dad, breaks down and gives, you know, I guess it's a test, testing his son. Uh, so he eventually gives him the jet so that uh, Rita and, uh, and Cyborg can catch up to everybody. And then Jane meets the real puppet man. When the, the Swiss Miss people bring her in there, you see that he's like a puppet too. Or like to keep himself alive, he's like a wind up. You know, this guy, I mean, they must be working in shifts to keep him alive. This just crank going on and on and on. Uh, and you got to give it up to the actor, again, who plays this guy. He He's in the chamber, and he's all put together very much like a crazy Nazi science experiments would look like. Um, and we find out that, uh, that uh, hang on. We find out that uh, Jane was experiment on, experimented on, and it was the chief that helped her. So she has no sympathy for this guy. This guy is basically doing what was done to her to other people, except people are paying for it now. Um, and still, I should say, still are. Uh, Larry enters the chamber to try to extract his hitchhiker, which works in a way, but also he can't get, it won't let him out, and Larry basically is telling himself that another side of his personality uh, the one that uh, from his that was his lover that he caused all this that it was his problem and and he's not wrong he's not right it's a complicated thing to me Larry just needs to stop running and face who he is and what he is and he's never done it and he still hasn't and this thing inside him is trying to work with him in a in a weird way, and I feel like we're definitely going to get a lot more out of that. But um, this is when the Von Trapp family Nazi lovers all show up. At all of the one mind where the the scientist says, you know, I like you have many personalities in one body. I am one body with many personalities outside. And this is where we get this really really fun fight, uh, robot man just getting to completely pulverize these people and again when they're Nazis you don't care what happens to them um, so the gorier the better and it keeps upping the ante I love it uh, the whole double bird <laughs> from Robot Man is great and uh, Jane turning into the personality that can turn words into knives again that's so Deadpool. God, that's such a Deadpool thing. I, I mean, it's not something he can do, but it's something that would definitely I would see in like one of his comics. I feel like, and it's such a cool event and and moment in this. Um, and when she kills him, she says to her that this wasn't a victory for you. Uh, nothing that you've ever done is a, is yours. It's n and and he talks about that whatever happened to little Jane. Like, is she the core personality? You don't quite know. And that's pretty much where the episode ends. They all kind of get back on the plane, tails a little bit between their legs, but they learn more about the chief and how a lot of this stuff that's happening is because of what he's done. But, you know, is it the ends that justify the means kind of situation that we're going to be in? I don't know. 
But the poor guy, well, not the poor guy, but the guy from the beginning of the episode, I think he was like an entourage, wasn't he? Uh, so take that as you want. Um, <laughs> but he comes out with a whole bunch of different things wrong with him. I guess he was left in there a little too long because he's got like a, almost looked like celery, but it's not. And he's got like a like plant part of him and looks like, I, I don't know, but <laughs> he's got a dinosaur on the other side of his head. And I so wanted that dinosaur to, like, bite his fucking head off. But, oh, I, come on. I, I just, I totally expected it to turn, look at him, and just go chomp. But well, I guess we'll, maybe we'll see this guy later on. I don't know. But again, another really solid episode. Uh, I, we're peeling back the layers on all the characters. So, like I said, I don't have too many expectations for this season, other than it's still written really well, and I want our characters to develop and become a co more cohesive team and understand their powers more by the end of it. And it feels definitely like we're on that track. So uh, I can't wait to watch episode four. Probably won't be till tomorrow, maybe late tonight that I'll get to episode four. Otherwise, if you like this review, please hit that like button, comment, share, subscribe, all that jazz. Otherwise, this is Robert Smirking Interviews, and have a great night, and we will see you next time.